Well, welcome very much to our session number seven. As you can see, these are being um, recorded as well. So if there's any other sessions you want to look back on, you can find those on this website. If there's any information you want to share with others, that will also be on our council website. So today we are diving into our infrastructure challenges and also the opportunities. Last week we had two sessions, including a community open day, so a very busy day, um, where we actually stepped inside the demographic changes that we're seeing here in Rotorua, and also learnt about how we're responding to these housing challenges which have been discussed over previous sessions. So in the first session, uh, we had Natalie Hampson from Market Economics, and she talked about our demographics, you know, like gender, age, um, and what that has meant in relation to housing issues, but also the opportunities here in Rotorua, as well as Nick McNabb from the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development to give us a bit of a national context. So um, we've had some great guest speakers, and today we'll go back internally and have some of our Deputy Chief Executives talk to you. So in our second session um, last time, we also had Rachel Morgan from Barkers and Associates, um, who spoke on our focus on efficient growth as well as lining, aligning with what's called the National Policy Statement for Urban Design and providing us with more context to our Rotorua housing plan changes and also the design guide, um, speaking to our future growth strategy. So the idea with the last session was for everyone to get a better understanding on these work programs and what they might mean for us here in Rotorua. So we also want to thank everyone who came along to the open day um, and provided the opportunity to speak with our planners directly and also provide much valued feedback. Um, so thank you to you again today for coming along. This is an opportunity and there will be the opportunity at the end of um, the presentations today to be able to ask any questions. Now myself, um, also we've got elected member Shirley Trumper, who's our Rural Community Board Chairperson, and a number of our staff from Rotorua Lakes Council on board. So if you have any detailed questions about anything other than what's been on the presentation, we're also here um, to answer those questions for you. So these information sessions are really aimed at improving community understanding and also engaging with you. So it's been really great um, to see you here and have this information available because there has been a lot of work going on both behind the scenes and in the community. So. Our key housing messages here in Rotorua is that we know that we're dealing with a housing crisis and evidence shows that our city unfortunately has a severe lack of homes but council is working with urgency to respond to that demand. So as Rotorua continues to grow and change we will need to be ready for it but the good thing is we are acting now. So our community of Rotorua now has the opportunity to plan for a future that enables our city to grow in a way that not only protects but also enhances the things that we love about our district. So Rotorua, we don't want us to be a victim of growth. There are still plenty of housing opportunities, so we need to get it right. The housing crisis is not just being felt in Rotorua though. It's not just being felt in New Zealand. It is universal. But we do have some challenges that are unique to our home here in Rotorua that we need to respond to. So Rotorua is actually in a good position to act on the growth that um, we're experiencing. And we can also learn from other cities. So housing is council's number one priority. Council's role, um, just so you're aware, is actually to enable and encourage growth, as well as building partnerships with those who can actually deliver. Um, and we need to help together our communities to thrive because we know that we can't do this alone just with council so we'll keep working together to help Rotorua reach its potential as a great place to live, work, play and also to continue to invest. So we want people who love Rotorua to be involved in these plans so thank you again for coming along um, so that we can build a city that everyone can and wants to live in. So um, council also wants to acknowledge the important role that mana whenua play Te Aroa, who in council is committed to working together to ensure that the values and principles of Te Aroa underpin our conversations about growth, housing, wellbeing and environment and they've been very kind in coming to share their aspirations of growth too. So um, we'll kick into this session. The agenda today is looking at the role of infrastructure and how that supports housing, growth and the challenges that we can face. We'll also discuss about how growth is funded, which is always the big question, um, and we'll look at how we can fund it now, but also any considerations for the future. Um, so today we have with us Stavros Michael from the Rotorua Lakes Council. Now Stavros is our DCE of Environmental and Infrastructure Solutions, 
and he'll be talking to us about enabling infrastructure and also ensuring its resilience. We'll then go to Thomas Colley, who is also from the Rotary Lakes Council and is our DCE for organisational enablement. So Thomas will then talk us through some of the funding aspects and how infrastructure is funded and what considerations we need to make moving forward. And again, at the end of the presentations, we'll take any questions uh, that you have. Um, and I'd now like to invite Stavros up to share his presentation. Thank you, Councillor Tubson. Kia ora tata katoa. Um, good evening. Um, as Councillor Tubson said, I am the uh, DC for infrastructure, which uh, in, in, in broad terms means our transport, our three waters, you know, infrastructure that underlies our growth. Um, since we are into a, a library environment, I thought it would be worthwhile reminding us that historically, uh, when you look into thriving communities, um, as far back as our history can tell us, and started with a little city called Jericho, which is about uh, 10 kilometers southeast of Jerusalem, about 10,000 years BC. It was the first time people got together and started building common infrastructure, roads, water supplies, and so on. And of course, you know, uh, without um, safe, uh, stable, and reliable infrastructure, history teaches us that we cannot grow, we cannot thrive, and we cannot be safe. So what's our infrastructure? Um, this is quite um, um, important, I think, for everyone to note. Uh, our infrastructure has a replacement value of about $1.3 billion for Rotorua. Uh, if we actually use today's uh, replacement cost, you might find that our, the actual cost is for the, to replace our infrastructure is about $1.5 billion if we adjust it to current, you know, to current rates and current um, costs. Often people talk about assets, and of course infrastructure assets, in community infrastructure assets are not like our common assets. Your house, my house, a car, but we can sell down the market and get some value out of it. Once we build that infrastructure to serve our needs, the current and the future needs, uh, we have a perpetual responsibility to maintain, renew, and upgrade them as the need arises, and especially as Councillor Tubson said. Uh, when we look into a future need for housing, if we want going to add another 10,000 houses to our community, every one of those houses will add additional demand for water supply, transportation, uh, for stormwater management, for sewage uh, demand and, and treatment, and of course, with time, that goes by, uh, we have new standards, new regulations, new community expectations, and every time we do upgrades to our infrastructure, we need to account for these new demands. And you would understand the costs of this uh, uh, is carried by the community. And my colleague Thomas will explain later on how do we distribute uh, those costs you know, to the community via our, our funding strategies. Again, I'll start with the transportation. Rotorua is in a hub. We are in the uh, center of the North Islands. Uh, we are a community that straddles uh, the um, uh, northern regions of Hamilton and, 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 and on Auckland to Auckland, to the east uh, Tauranga, to the south Tavo. And obviously, you are set with some major state highways, State Highway 5 to the west, and State Highway 30 to the east. Uh, we working with uh, Waka Kotahi, which is a uh, New Zealand transport agency, and of course, in conjunction with them, we have defined a long-term strategy of improving those state highways in order to service both our residential needs, our freight needs, our, 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 our commercial needs, you know, and obviously those state highways play a critical um, role in that ability to connect south, east, and north. Uh, in addition to that, and of course, taking into consideration future challenges, uh, especially with the environment, uh, we are encouraging um, uh, the gradual um, diversion or shifting of um, the methodologies of moving us around our district. We're encouraging people to use more effectively cycling, walking, uh, and of course, those, got those kind of active modes of transport instead of our private vehicles, uh, including public transports, have some significant benefits for our community. 
uh, there are health benefits obviously, but also in future proving our capacity needs to ensure that we have enough space for the vehicles. I'm pretty sure most of you will be surprised to know that our roading network in Rotorua accommodates about 250,000 vehicle movements each day. And we are a small city, we are not a big city. So every time we move our vehicle, obviously we create both congestion but also environmental degradation and obviously you know, it's got the possibility of increasing accident risk and safety risks you know, to our road users. So we have over the last few years invested significant amounts of money to create a network of what we call shear paths. That's an example we've got here. We created about 35 kilometers of our total 1,000 kilometers of roads we own, where people can walk, cycle, the kids can walk to school, can push their, um, their, 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 their little toys you know, on a sheer path in relative safety. Um, we've got some significant gains for that, uh, because over the last you know, two, three years, we, not, we identified that we achieved somewhere in the region of 150% increases and improvements to the way kids go to school. Rotorua has got somewhere in the region of 18,000 children that go between the age of 5 and 18 that go to school. And traditionally, we as parents drop our kids to school and pick them up. But over the last few years, since we've created those you know, shared path um, facilities, we've noticed that more and more kids walk or cycle to schools. And that has got health benefits, environmental benefits, and obviously congestion benefits. But again, it's a significant investment, and obviously we need to balance it over with the ability uh, we, have, we, have, we have to pay for that. Again, the second area is our water supplies. Uh, we are delivering to the Rotorua district somewhere in the region of 40 million liters of drinking water each day. Uh, that water supplies come from um, uh, water springs mainly, uh, and that, that water in those water springs is not generated by rainfall that fell over yesterday. Generally, it's water that fell from the sky between 50 and 60 years ago. That gives us a significant advantage of other areas where they rely heavily on surface storage. Now, we do have a lot of surface storage. We are blessed with about 11, 12 lakes in the area, and if you look into Rotorua Lake alone, uh, that lake contains about 800 million cubic meters of 800 billion liters you know, of water. We don't use it at this point in time, but we do have an opportunity in the future if our water supply from the springs reduces or for any reason have constraints, we can always utilize our water for surface storage for water supplies. But it creates a lot of demand for us to create a water network with all the pipes and the pump stations, purification, making it safe and healthy for people to, clean, to drink. The other biggest challenge we've got with regards to our, um, our infrastructure is the management of stormwater. Now we all hear about the effect of climate change uh, and in general speaking people say that with climate change we will have more frequent a higher intensity rainfalls. And I know a lot of people are getting used to this idea of a flood of one in a hundred years or one in 50 years or one in 20 years and so on. I chose that photo to show you because this is on the rainfall event we had on the 30th of May, you know, a couple of weeks ago. That was only one in five years storm event. And that area you see in front of you is it just um, west or north of Fukihangi Road. It's an area that is earmarked for future land development and we expect to see somewhere in the region of 800 to 1,000 new houses up there too. Although this is a green field area with a lot of grass and a lot of permeable surfaces, an event that, you know, that had a return period of one in five years created all these saturation points with a lot of stormwater running down Pukihangi Road and created that kind of effect. Now, when we're building future housing, we have a national and regional statutory obligation to take measures to improve the stormwater management system in a way that will address a one in a hundred year return period. Now, often people talk about the lack of piping and the sizing of the pipes for stormwater, but of course that's easier than you know, said than done. The next approximation we've got for a piped system into the city is our sewage system. Our sewage system takes our wastewater from our properties to a treatment plant. 
and is self-contained. It very rarely breaks down and allows that to escape in the environment, although from time to time we have some incidents. But that sewage system is only designed to accommodate about 20 to 30,000 cubic meters of water each day. That rainfall event you see in front of you here has generated over a period of about eight hours in excess of three million cubic meters of water. So you can understand for us to invest in capturing all that water and managing it through pipes, it's simply 150 times more costly than the sewage system. And our sewage system is worth over $500 million. So we've got challenges, we've got financial challenges, technical challenges, and obviously practical challenges to manage the stormwater. And therefore, in the future, as we build more houses, we create more impermeable surfaces, and we have to have a, a long-term stormwater management plan that will take into consideration the climate change and the increasing uh, prevalence you know, of new houses and impermeable surfaces. So what to do about it? Uh, we have created over the last year or so a future master plan, and we have recognized the fact that we cannot possibly financially or practically pipe all the future stormwater generated by, by floods, by, by rain events. Therefore, what we do need to do is to manage it in, in ways that we hold it at a sufficient time, so by the time it gets to the streams and then drains into the lakes, is of sufficient quantity and appropriate quantity so we avoid flooding. This is these yellow uh, areas, the circles you see, these are the areas you identified in the eastern suburbs where all the rainfall coming onto the hills or running towards the lake will be detained, stored you know, for a period of time and then released slowly so the existing houses downstream don't get flooded. We've got the same thing in the western side, that is Bukit Hang area and you know, especially the area of proposed new development, and you can see how storage areas in what we call public spaces like Linton Park, Rides Park, Mangakahi area, and the whole idea is that as stormwater runs, it's held in, 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 in those areas through appropriate detention areas, and then released slowly into the Hina stream, so we don't put the houses, the existing houses, you know, in danger. However, all these sort of things cost a lot of money. Uh, that stormwater plan you see in front of you here, will eventually aim to achieve this. We will manage the, from the western side, Pogehangi, through a, a number of detention areas that flows towards Loyu to Hina in a way that will not increase the flooding risk. In the center, center of the city, we will upgrade our stormwater system and divert as much as we can to the east. Otherwise, we're overloading the Yutuhina stream and to the, and on the east. As you saw earlier, we have some detention dams, and from there we release it slowly towards the lake. The estimated total value of those detention dams over the next few years will be in excess of 150 to 200 million dollars. So this is significant amounts of money that needs to be invested to allow us to progress future housing and, uh, and protect existing properties for the possibility of flooding risk. The other area, of course, is that you know, if your average house, we all get up in the morning, go and have a shower, you know, wash our dishes, do our laundry, you know, and so on, and we generate somewhere in the region of a half a cubic meter of wastewater every day. Uh, again, contrary to popular belief, out of that half a, million, half a cubic meter of wastewater or sewage every day, only one quarter of it comes from toilets. The majority of it comes from our laundries, from our showers and, 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 and kitchen sinks and so on. But it still contains harmful um, um, material that should not be released into the environment. And therefore, a treatment plan at the end of the network that is worth about $500 million is treating that wastewater, removes nutrients, removes pathogens, removes you know, as much of the harmful materials as we know at this point in time before we release it into the atmosphere. As we add houses, obviously that capacity to receive and convey wastewater and treat it at an appropriate level, it needs to continue to increase. And we are in the process at the moment of increasing our, of improving our wastewater treatment plan to the level that will accommodate our future projected needs, which basically will double our capacity to treat wastewater. Because we're making investments in such facilities that are not really for one or two, three years, but they have a horizon of at least 50 years, 
we will invest you know, in excess of $60 million in that in a particular in a facility because without that, we cannot protect our community, we cannot provide a stable and reliable service, and we cannot protect our environment. And again, that's another area here which obviously you know, the capacity of the treatment plan needs to be appropriate to accommodate the future growth and accommodate our future needs at a way that meets all the relevant regulations. So uh, I know it's rushed, I know it was quick. Uh, I had only 15 minutes and quite frankly, I could spend hours talking about infrastructure here too, but the reality is that hopefully that gives you a bit of a picture as to what we have now, what we have invested as a community into infrastructure and the fact that this is a responsibility in perpetuity for us. We cannot sell the assets we've got we have to continue to maintain them and therefore as their needs and demands increase we need to keep up with that. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Thomas Collet. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive for Organisational Enablement and also the uh, Chief Financial Officer. I'll just move a little bit closer. Um, when talking about growth, I think uh, just a bit of a clarification. You know, Stavros highlighted the fact that we have about $1.3 billion worth of infrastructure assets. And over the next 10 years, Council plans to spend uh, close to $700 million um, looking after them in one way or another. Um, about $400 million over the 10 years, or about $40 million every every year, is actually replacing like for like. And so that's it may be a, a pipe is close to its end of its life and it needs replacement or a pump station or so forth. Uh, there's probably another couple of hundred million which uh, relates to improving the levels of, of service. So it may be that certain infrastructure is constrained uh, or needs to be improved as um, uh, demands from say central government require us to say treat uh, wastewater better or improve the, the quality of our water like putting UV treatment on. And then we're spending about $60 million to fund growth. And growth really means is that uh, of our existing network of infrastructure, um, the money that we have to spend in response to more housing or more commercial developments, which means that the existing infrastructure can't um, cope with that and needs to be improved on by either putting in bigger pipes into areas to allow for a new subdivision or putting whole new networks in to support them as well. And so that's what we're talking about with regards to growth. So for council, there's about three ways of, of funding that. Uh, there's the general ratepayer paying uh, for it, and there's a portion of that growth infrastructure that, that probably does support that. So um, that's just generally done by a debt, and then um, future rates, which recover the cost of that debt. Another method is uh, on charging directly to developers, and there's a couple of ways of, of doing that. So as a developer does a development, if they trigger a, a piece of infrastructure that needs upgrading, um, they could be charged directly for a contribution to do that. Or if um, there's a, a wider um, infrastructure spend that's been identified in, say, a development contributions policy, that development will pay a development contribution as well. Uh, and then the third is external funding. And those sort of avenues are like NZTA or Waka Kotahi. Uh, they provide a subsidy to um, look after our roading and grow our roading. Um, and also uh, central government with regards to Crown Infrastructure Partner Funding and uh, the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund, whereby the uh, government is providing local councils with additional resources to help uh, with infrastructure challenges. And so those are generally the three mechanisms available to us um, at the moment. So I'll touch on external funding uh, first of all. So at the moment, uh, Rotorua was successful uh, with regards to a number of applications. So there's about $20 million worth of work going out on the east side, which is actually predominantly supporting the Whare Nui Rise uh, development. And that was via the, the PGF, or the Provincial Growth Fund. And so that's about a $20 million stormwater investment. There's also uh, a little bit more with regards to roading improvements that are also going into that corridor and you would have seen obviously across uh, Tenai the, the improvements that have been taking place over the last uh, number of years and uh, again they are there to support growth. Uh, we're currently in the process of um, applying for the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund from Central Government uh, and that's about a $100 million application and that's predominantly to um, improve uh, and deliver well actually accelerate all the stormwater work that we've got in our longer 30-year infrastructure strategy 
and try and compress it into a, a shorter window by central government funding a large portion of it, which would then for allow or free up uh, the development in particular uh, into the central area with regards to intensification, but more so out west side with regards to the Pukahangi um, developments. And I think thirdly, as I said before, um, subsidies from NZTA. So Council does, at the moment, in our long-term plan, uh, plan to spend about $30 million over the next 10 years to, on directly on infrastructure that supports growth. Uh, we have signalled in our long-term plan that we intend to uh, reintroduce development contributions, which I'll go into shortly. Uh, but currently, the method of funding that growth uh, is that it is borrowed. We borrow to fund that growth, and the, the general rate payer, uh, through either a targeted rate or the general rates, would pay to repay that debt and therefore is funding growth. And so that is the, the current, as we speak, uh, method of funding growth. I think there's some, some challenges with that and some opportunities with that as well. Um, and so you are spreading that cost of growth across a, a very wide uh, ratepayer um, database uh, base. And also from a developer perspective, there's a benefit to them with regards to uh, costs that are incurred as uh, they are doing the developments, uh, they're not paying for it and therefore the, the rate pay are paying for it. And there's a question around the fairness and equality uh, into, that, into that question. And so, <coughs> what we've seen is um, an argument to uh, reintroduce uh, development contributions. And so, uh, over the years our district um, has grown and this is the, the number of building consents that have been uh, issued on an annual basis. Uh, for quite some n number of times. Now, Council did previously have development contributions and they were removed uh, probably at the, uh, the lowest point around 2013 when that's when New Zealand as a whole, but also Rotorua, was not seeing a lot of, a lot of growth. Uh, and so development contributions at that time uh, were removed. And since then, what we've seen is uh, an uplift in um, applications for building consents. You've seen it not only in Rotorua, but across New Zealand. And in response to that, Council has had to also uh, identify infrastructure that needs to be invested in to support that growth. So, for those that don't know what development contributions are, they, they're a charge that is set under the Local Government Act. And it's a charge that is really used and can only be used to fund growth. So, within our infrastructure strategies, so every three years, Council is required to prepare a 30-year infrastructure strategy that looks at all our infrastructure, how we're looking after it, and how we intend to invest it into it going forward. And within that, there'll be an element that's targeted specifically for growth. And so the development contributions links directly to those infrastructure assets that we're looking to invest into, and looks to recover a portion of those via a charge directly against developments. And so that's what development contributions do. So they can't be used to fund uh, operating costs, they can't be used to fund the look at, spend to look after our existing assets, they can only be used to um, fund infrastructure that is having to be invested in to support growth. And across New Zealand, uh, nearly all councils have a uh, development contributions policy. And how they generally fall is uh, if there's a subdivision and uh, the developer will pay a charge per house lot, and those charges, depending on where they are, um, can range from 5000 and in some places up to twenty or $30,000. And it's therefore each house lot that's being created is paying their share of the growth infrastructure uh, that that development is, is leading to. So there are advantages and disadvantages of development contributions. And so just so you know that Council is currently out consulting on the proposed development contributions policy. Uh, my understanding is it does close tomorrow, so those that are interested in submitting, uh, it's, a, it's a small window now to, to respond to that. But obviously with, with the um, DCs, uh, the main argument really is that growth pays for growth. So those people that are, are driving the developments and are benefiting from creating those developments are therefore paying their fair share of the increased infrastructure costs as a result of those. And that's the main uh, benefit for having DCs. Uh, I think I've already touched on um, on this slide, so I'll just skip past. So we are in the process, as I said, um, consulting on our development contributions. This is the, the draft set of charges that um, that we currently have. So we are looking at um, 
a proposal whereby there'll be a, a $2,000 charge uh, that recognises the, the growth component on our water network, uh, $1,600 charge with regards to the extra demands on our waste water network, and then about a, a $7,000 charge for stormwater excluding the Rongataha region. And that's uh, just a reflection of probably what Stavros was talking about as well. Our main challenge in front of us at the moment is actually predominantly stormwater, and that's where we're seeing the most of our investment is actually going into. Uh, and so, as I said, this is currently out, out for consultation. Um, I think the simple thing is there is no real easy answer uh, with regards to how, how to fund this, and going forward we'll continue to use probably those three levers available, uh, subject to obviously Council's decision on development contributions, that may be a lever available. Uh, we also uh, leverage, uh, continue to leverage external funding to help pay for, for growth and also use a mix of, of debt where it is uh, uh, appropriate. Um, so with that, um, happy to take any questions from either Stavros or myself. <laughs>